so that in the future he will become a peace builder and no more, for example, a soldier. Because in that uh, child care center where they got all the important uh, school education and a lot of other peace education and trauma rehabilitation, they also learned, for example, to help now out other children in the town to give them um, homework and so on. And so they have completely changed. So this just as one example, what I wanted to say about this statement of inner peace to outer peace. Okay, just to have an overview about what has been described already uh, for the presentation or the description of this session. So we will talk about well-being where we talk first of all about internal well-being, which means internal psycholo psycholo psychological, social, cultural and spiritual state of inner balance, strength, peace, or calm, harmony, or resilience. These are just some of the words how we can describe it. And of course, inner well-being is also linked or interconnected with external well-being. So the external connect conditions of comfort, good livelihood, and health, security, safety, good governance, and of course, also justice. So of course, you can develop much better an internal well-being if you also have external circumstances where you have a good living. For example, I know in, in South Sudan, the women in the refugee camps, although they had done several seminars on trauma work and they were quite aware about trauma, they told me with all those ongoing problems we face every day, we get re-traumatized and re-traumatized. So the other way around. So this is already one connection. Then you can see that also external well-being will also be connected to what we call a lasting positive peace. That is where you don't have any conflict or war or instead you, you, you manage to re resolve your conflicts without violence. You can strive for socioeconomic development and you can create good living conditions. So this is also linked. Um, I don't know why this comes up again. Okay, let's go from internal well-being to the contrary of it, which is internal, what I call now unwellness. It's a feeling of imbalance, of stress, sadness, depression, fear, tension, and aggression. Loneliness, despair, traumatic, dissociative, or physical disorders. So this can even go up to very deep traumatic uh, disorders, which then can take a long time to overcome. And normally these people will suffer if they don't really get good therapy, they will suffer from it all their life and even pass it on to the next generation. So, and now we have a look how both of them are linked to the other side. If you go to the internal unwellness, so if people once are imbalanced, then they develop a lot of resentment and lack of trust towards others or even hatred, even hatred against their neighbors in the next village. And they, in order to just to protect their own identity because they feel so much uh, unprotected is that they make this difference between we and the others. So the others are enemies and no more friends. So often this ends up that persons, families, and even whole communities, they lose their social and also cultural integrity and identity, and you get more and more psychosocial destabilization. All of this I could observe, for example, in South Sudan. And on the contrary, well, of course, let's go to the right side. And if you're in such a state of hatred, resentment, so the smallest conflicts which might come up again will also trigger again uh, uh, um, violent um, conflicts and violent clashes. And so you have repeated conflicts, civil wars, you have very much more sexual and domestic violence, and it can even go up to a lot of atrocities, massacres, and the complete dehumanization. And on the other hand, if you, have an, if you could develop an internal well-being, you become able again to reconcile, to forgive, 
to respect others and to feel solidarity with others. And you come to that feeling of we are together and you can create again psychosocial intercultural integrity which then again leads you to lasting positive peace and what we've already seen you can build up an economic development and good living conditions so just to show one more which is often with trauma is the vicious cycle of transgenerational reproduction of trauma mistrust and violence you can see if violent conflict situation war, uh, and traumatic experiences, especially in war or civil war, they affect then women, children, men and communities and they become victims and aggressors again, especially men often then they try to compensate their traumatic experiences by more aggression, by more control. So that leads to the situation that if you don't address trauma in a substantial recovery way so there will be a growth of mistrust fear resentment anger and hatred and little or no reconciliation and the lack of positive and proactive attitudes for constructive development so people also tend then to avoid or to address or just to block solution finding patterns which then again, oh dear, where are the pictures? I have to put them here. Um, so the lack for the resilience then for nonviolent conflict solutions uh, and uh, the substantively be to trigger again new violent conflicts will then again lead to more conflicts, to more civil wars, to and again to more traumatic experiences. So this is something we should take, we should be aware of because. Um, we don't just get rid of trauma and trauma and other psycho and mental pro health problems need to be addressed if we want to get peaceful situations and lasting peace so that people can still be able to to build up again some peace and reconciliation and i want to uh, now i want to welcome our first speaker because he will tell us about such a case. And it's Professor, why do, okay. Professor Dr. Jan Ilhan Kieselhan. He comes, well, he is in Germany now and he created the Institute for Transcultural Health Science. But if I'm right, you came from Iraq, from the Kurdish people and- uh, From uh, Turkey, from Turkey. Turkey, okay, yes. Turkey, but still Kurdish. But yes? doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, so you were the one who developed a transcultural psychotraumatology, and you became quite known in Germany, especially when you did that uh, rescue operation to take about more than a thousand Yazidi women. Which ha who had been persecuted and abducted in Iran by the ISIS. And you brought them to Germany so they can get psychotraumatic um, therapy um, treatment. But now you've also started to build up centers for psychotrauma traumatology in Iraq itself so that local psychotherapists can be trained to help the people over there. Okay, I would like to leave the word to you now. So I take back my, oh, how do I, can you just put your PowerPoint and mine will go? I try, I will try. <laughs> um, no, you have to go out. How, just do, I, on how the, do I go out? On the right side. You can, you can up at the top, it'll say stop sharing. Oh, on the top. Uh, okay, new file. Yes, I see. Okay. Yes. No. Where is it? Stop. Start starting. No. Uh -oh. oh, yes. Now I see. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So please, Jan, you start first. Thank you very yes. much. Let me just try to find my... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Otherwise, shall I put it? Mm, no, just wait a second. May I can do it. Can you see it now? No, not yet. Not yet. We're seeing your whiteboard. Okay. Yeah. Let's see why. I try it again. I will try again. Just give me one second. Oh, it's still whiteboard. Yeah, you could write it now. I don't know why. Maybe you need to st stop sharing the whiteboard or uh, mm -hmm. and click on the other. Whom do you mean, Matthew, me or him? Um, here, here he goes. But... Oh, yes. No. This is the email program. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll try again. Just. No, actually, it doesn't work. So let's see. Um, why? Maybe I still need to do something. No, it's no. just, uh, I have some, I don't know, see why where's the problem actually. Uh, bridge and Frank Haven. Uh, maybe I just change it. I went to several participants. Try again now. I changed to that function. It wasn't yet open to several participants. I hope I can do it in my function. Yes, it, it, there's Try again now. It should work now. Yeah. Okay. Let's try again. You cannot see it, no? No, not yet. Okay. I will try it without. It's fine. Or it's shall okay. I just put it? If it's possible, yes. Yeah. Okay. And you just tell me then which one I should uh, do. Okay. Okay. There we are. Um, do I still need to do something else? The first one? I don't okay. see it. You don't see it. I see it on. Okay, no, I I'm on my own screen. No, wait a minute. Um, I have to share. Okay. But it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. Uh, if not, it's not. I can see. First now, send it. No. Okay, it doesn't matter. So I will okay, start with maybe it's slides. It's easier fine. than I don't know how to put this. No, no, it's okay. It's fine. Good. Thank you very much, firstly, for the invitation. And I will talk a little bit about my personal experiences with uh, surf traumatized uh, women and girls who were in IS captivity. And from this part, I will talk a little bit about the aspect of transcultural. Uh, psychotherapy and psychotraumatology and how to cope and of course it's a part of well-being and have a perspective for the future and after the terrorist attack uh, Kari mentioned it before uh, by so-called Islamic State and the brutal and inhuman uh, situation that German government uh, decided to take 1,100 most vulnerable women and girls uh, for medical treatment to Germany. I was a medical and psychological head of this program and we take in 2015 uh, more than 1,100. During the, this time I was mainly in Iraq, based in Iraq and speak to 1,400 women personally. And the stories actually were not easy to come to the terms with. And um, whenever I thought um, I had just been told the worst story of terror and utmost inhumanity, I had to listen to further tragic and incredible stories. So I had in my picture one girl that you, unfortunately you cannot see it, but it was Yasmin. She was 16 years old. And we wake up at the night. She was before in the hand of the IS. IS was worried that the um, IS can return back and rape her again. She got up, sprinkled her face with food and set her in fire to herself. Uh, she survived, fortunately, but uh, her facial skin and hands were burned. 
And she told me every time, if I am ugly, they will not rape me again. This was for her very important. But nevertheless, uh, the strength and hope of the young woman who spent many hours facing me uh, actually impressed me very much. Despite all those immeasurable cruel experiences, uh, they keep fighting. So why I'm talking about uh, this terrible case is because, ladies and gentlemen, uh, these are real and we have to ask ourselves uh, how we can accompany the survivors of terror so that they learn to deal with the past uh, and again have a perspective. Even they will not forget uh, this traumatic events. Uh, as a scientist, you and me, we know and can classify this action according to range of political, sociological, uh, psychological theories. But um, sitting across from this woman, uh, seeing them cry, doubled over, ashamed in pain, I try to understand it from the perspective of a human being. Uh, this means dehumanized, sexualized violence against women, for example, in former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, or currently against the Yazidis, and another minority in Iraq and Syria, and also in Rohingya and other countries in the world, and has shown us how cruel human being can treat other human being. And so this is something that we should not forget even if we will have a, maybe you know, living in a better situation. This means as a result, the survivors as well as the collective they belong uh, to uh, can be traumatized for decades. Forms of violence range from rape, harassment, mutilation, enslavement, marking the person by branding to killing the victim. The emotional well-being and psychosocial life situation of those affected can be impacted actually several dimensions. One hand, they may, they may carry unforeseen traumatic experiences accompanied by experience of fleeing of migration and being uprooted. On the other hand, war changes, values and norms of people impact the war and can be changed. Uh, can you go to slide seven? I see now my own slides. Maybe yeah, I just seven. uploaded again. Um, okay. Yeah. That doesn't matter. Here we are. This shows just, uh, I, we did a study with children and they ex told us how they experience violence. So therefore, uh, we have to understand actually our patient and the burden. Uh, we must also all understand the reason why uh, of this, they face this violation. For example, the so-called IS or Islamic State is not just a terror organization. No, it's persuade, this persuades uh, totalitarian ideology, instrumentalize Islamic symbolism and act with previous unknown destructive forces as we could see, like by the Nazi, uh, Nazi regime in Germany through the Second World War. That means from my understanding, that we don't not only work in a closed room as a psychotherapist. Our job is not just to concern how to reduce symptoms. As a doctor, as physicians, uh, social workers, psychotherapists, we are a part of the society and have a responsibility and duty to respond to violence and abuse. Uh, violence is not isolated case. Uh, violence came from, uh, in my, my, my understanding, from the heart of the society, and at least we have to be open for that. We must understand men and society in relation to violence, historically and current in the entire nature. Now, can you go to slide eight, if it's possible, please? So we can, uh, if I tell you so much about the historical cruelty of the human being, uh, another question is, shall we give now up? Uh, and this is the reason why we today together, and no, we should not give up, because in my own experience in the last 20 years as a trauma expert and therapist, I have seen so much strong person, especially women and girls, who are still fighting for the survival. They fight these horrific memories every day in their lives. They fight to regain hope. They want to have a future again. They want to have confidence in humanity again, death and the desire for security, actually closeness and love go hand in hand. So the survivors of terror, violence, abuse, torture and fighting, they're fighting every day because they want, 
they have a hope. So why we should lose hope, we must and help support them in my opinion. So, but what to do? Uh, slide nine, please. This means in the case of survivors of war, we are faced with groups that have been persecuted and excluded for centuries. This is not the first time over generation like in Iraq, Syria and other countries. Transgeneration trauma is passed on from generation to the next generation. Like can you see in the uh, slide by the Yazidis, the two means historically they faced 74 genocide until 2014, the last one in, uh, was um, caused by IS. This means it's a transgeneration trauma, which is past the historical trauma to the next generation. Also, there's a collective trauma, which means on the 3rd August 2014, the IS aimed to destroy the whole society, not just take some of the women or girls. And of course, there's the individual trauma. Individual trauma means all of them have their own uh, pain and own situation. So we are talking about three parts or three types of trauma, transgeneration trauma, collective trauma, and individual trauma. Uh, could you go to the... Jan, you are muted. We can't hear you. How is it now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, you should hear me now. Okay. So this is important to have to understand that the trauma that we are talking about is not just one type of trauma. And it depends on cultures like in Africa, for example, or in other countries, they face for many, many generations. So what we can do as a psychotherapist or as a physician, so first of all, of course, uh, need a secure environment. If you don't have secure environment, you cannot do any stabilization, which is uh, very, very difficult sometimes when we were working in Iraq, we were 30 kilometers close to the IS fighting and the people were worried, they are feared and they have no future. But despite this, if we are in contact with them, we can give them uh, some, some information, something like uh, psychoeducation. So first as a therapist and social workers, uh, we have to actually find a new approach how to deal with them. Uh, this is much about trust, trust between patients and therapists' relation, to be honest. Honestly means, yes, there is a danger of bombs, there is a danger of escape. However, it's still, in my opinion, possible to stabilize the patients through a good relationship and psychoeducation. At this point, we must remember that people from traditional communities are not individual like in Western countries. The family is very important, the tribes are very important, they are living in a social system. So the well-being situation of an individual is depend on the well-being of the society and the collective. And they are linked together and the thought is different. So the approach to different cultures means to find new ideas of the Western ideas of psychotherapy. We had to adapt in so-called culture-sensitive psychotherapy. Just give you an example, in the modern way of psychotherapy with traumatized patients, they, um, uh, it's, it's a need to, to have a confrontation with the idea, with the traumatized situation. In some traditional family, to confront them with the trauma is sometimes very difficult. So in, especially in the Yazidis, I cannot say, close please your eyes and remember how you raped. So it's a feeling of a shame and they don't want to talk about this. 
And in some studies, we can find that sometimes not talking about traumatized event is a rehabilitation themselves. So it's depend on the culture, it depends on the individual, and this has to be taken into account if we're talking about that. And how far psychotherapy trauma work is possible? Also, it depends also in the case of sexuality. I talked to, since 2014, I'm Iraq, and I talked to more than 3,000 young women who were raped by IS, and they are belong to a very traditional culture, and the uh, sexuality became a very important issue uh, because they are ashamed to talk about them. So we did a study maybe on the slide uh, 12, if you can see. So you can see the symptoms of the women that we uh, did, did the research and they react very different. And on the slide 13, you can see uh, there is a very link with a feeling of a shame and dissociation and crisis. That means this feeling of a be a shame uh, should be a part of the psychotherapy, very sensitive, but uh, we have to talk with them in another way, maybe. Uh, let me come to the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because uh, our session is also about well-being and peace. This means dealing with emotional hurts means working for peace. Why? Psychology and trauma studies are still unfamiliar fields in Iraq and Syria and in other countries. The treatment of emotional hurts and dealing with the past are part of reconciliation and peace process, in my opinion. When people learn to deal with their own aggression, when they don't research violence as a solution, but see conservation, conversation and dialogue, then psychotherapy became important for the development of the society. Also, this is a very lack of studies that we see, but we started to do some studies about the impact of justice and psychotherapy. If there are injustice, how the people can feel secure, how the people can have the feeling, yes, tomorrow will be a better day. So in the aftermath of crimes against humanity, human rights violation and genocide, the question arise whether and how justice can be restored. Yet if war have a negative impact on health, then programs need to deal with them. For this reason, the importance of psychosocial well-being and mental health for the re reconstruction of society is acknowledged. Develop restoring justice also requires good psychosocial care. And so such a psychological treatment can make an important contribution when it's come to building new trust and improving mental health. So in my opinion, human rights and health and as well well-being with psychosocial support cannot separate it in psychotherapy with survivors of war and terror. The last pictures that you can see on the slides, uh, I put it in because despite this terror and uh, this pain that the woman faced, uh, they never lost hope. Um, you can see the burnt woman who became is now speaking in German, fluently German, German. She is training for a profession. And one is from Nadia Murad, maybe you know her from, she is a Nobel Peace Prize winner from 2018. When I met her first 2015 in Iraq, you will not uh, uh, believe in which kind of traumatized situation and pain situation I found her. But then we take her to Germany, did a treatment, and she became now the voice of the Yazidis, a very traditional society, but also a voice for the women worldwide. So we should not lose hope because in my experience, our patients still fighting and if they're fighting, we should be with them and support them. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jan Fizihan, about this. I still remember you when we had all those refugees in 2015, 2016. Exactly. And I was working myself on cult, uh, uh, trauma sensitive um, approaches towards refugees. That you were the first and the only one at the time who had published a book about this transcultural issues of trauma and how we should then. Uh, 
consider this when we try to help refugees. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, we are already running off to the time. So I would like to present as our next speaker, Kaylin Tanner. Okay, I, I'm not sure if I manage again to put up my own, um, how maybe Jan Kizihan can I try to send, no idea, stop. Okay, there we are. Okay, um, Helen Tanner, I don't know if I can show you again. Um, this one, and then again. Okay, Helen, um, she comes from England and she is a peace builder and also a forgiveness coach. So she was looking for her own ways uh, how to come up to build, build peace. And she, I think she, called, she had a lot of experiences also abroad uh, within uh, humanitarian work and working in Botswana, Tunisia, Libya, Myanmar, South Sudan, Kosovo, Belfast. So what I understand, they are all conflict areas. <laughs> so you must have had a lot of experience how people deal with that, how they manage. And out of this, you develop then, um, you became a Rotary Peace Fellow as well, and you did a degree in conflict resolution. And now you try to foster peace wherever you can, as I understood, and always in harmony with your own inner self, but also with the self of others. And what I really liked was, and together with the planet, and I liked your picture you sent me yesterday on Facebook, because we both have pictures where we stand against a tree. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, so I think you just go ahead because you will talk uh, uh, today about how we can use forgiveness for building peace, searching for peace, uncovering forgiveness. And I think you had such a nice um, abstract which uh, touched me. So I would like to leave <laughs> everything to you now. And not <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Helen. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Karin, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to you all. Um, so these are turbulent times for our global human family. And for many, it is unsettling, frightening, confusing, and there is a general feeling of instability. So on the one hand, we're responding with love, care, support for each other. But on the other, we are deeply divided. And as this division is exposed, so too is our historical wounding, our fear, and this hidden drive for vengeance. So at this crossroads, we are being offered an opportunity to find a new way of being and coexisting with all life on this living, breathing planet. This new way will require us to change at a systemic level, but also at a personal level. We here, as peace builders, we are being called to fully show up as the leaders and peacemakers that we are and were born to be. We are needed now more than ever to speak our truth, to step up, step out, be visible and be heard. And as we find the courage and fire in our hearts, let us be fueled by love, not by the accumulated rage of our unhealed traumas. May our rightful anger focus our energy, just as the arrow flies straight to its target into creating the new. How we build peace in this dawning age is as important as what we build. So we often discuss peace as though it is what's left when we are no longer at war with each other. But this viewpoint is not enough for it to be sustainable. We've got so many examples from around the world of where physical fighting may have stopped, but the healing never truly began. 
And it was only a matter of time before the fire of destruction once again sparked, maybe decades, maybe centuries later. If I asked you to imagine war and tell me what it looks like, what it feels like, it doesn't matter what age you are, where you come from, you can describe it to me and many of your descriptions will be the same. We don't have to think about it. Whether we have experienced it or not, we know war. We have been groomed and trained to imagine it as a normal and inevitable part of our life on this planet. But if I were to ask you all right here now to imagine peace, most of you would struggle to describe to me what life would look like, feel like, what we would be doing, how we would be living and interacting. We would need time to think about it, to find the right words. And the likelihood is that we would all come up with a very, very different idea about what it is. Um, Karen, could you take down your, your presentation there? Anyway. Um, presentation. You yeah, your presentation is still showing. It's still showing. Yes. Oh uh, up on the screen. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to do it. Okay, now. okay, don't, don't worry too much. Um, oh dear. No. Okay. Stop. Is it now? Yes, it is. Thank oh, you very much. Okay. Right, so I'll, ju I'll just start again from that last bit. Um, yeah, okay. so if I were to ask you all to imagine peace, most of you would dis really struggle to describe it to me. What life would look like, what it would feel like, what we would be doing, how we would be, li be living and interacting. We'd need time to find the right words and the likelihood we'd, we'd come up with a completely different idea of what it is. We are conditioned on an almost daily level to think about and imagine war. So our goal of peace begins with our vision of peace and step by step, we bring her to life. So we are moving to a time, not just of building peace, but of being peace, where she flows through us and guides us in our words and in our deeds. And three of the biggest questions we will need to answer in the creation of this new world will be how will we manage our conflicts without violence? How will we use our power in relation to others and to the planet and empower ourselves out of being the victim without ourselves then becoming the perpetrator? How will we manage our pain, our suffering we feel throughout our human experience? Free ourselves from this burden of rage, our pain, the past and those who have harmed us and return to the place of love. In order to be free, to live from a place of love and empowerment and to find sustainable peace within, we are required to make a journey not just once, but many times throughout our lifetime. It's a journey of healing along a very ancient path and we were required to let go of all that is not love. The release will be painful, but the reward magnificent. This journey, path and destination has a name and it is forgiveness. Forgiveness literally means to give forth or to give away. Forgiveness is not forgetting. It's not condoning or excusing behaviors. Forgiveness does not mean that you have to reconcile with the other person, nor does it exempt them from justice or legal accountability. It should never be used as an excuse to stay in an abusive situation or as a way of self-harming. Forgiveness is the eventual release of feelings of resentment, rage and desire for revenge towards someone who has harmed you for your own freedom, your own well-being and your own peace. Forgiveness is a choice, a repeated choice. We have to keep making the choice and it's your process. 
So in order to receive the gifts of peace, freedom and love, we must pass through the seven gates to forgiveness. And at each gate, there is an exchange. We have to give away in order to receive. So at the first gate of forgiveness, we are giving away the fear and illusion of disconnection from the earth, from each other and from the spirit of life. Here we must drop our roots back down into the earth and receive the deep knowing that we are safe, we are held and we are connected to the source of all life and that we are one. At the second gate of forgiveness, we let go of our painful stories and we create a new story to live by. One filled with hope, filled with joy, where the heroes and heroines are the creators, the peace builders, the carers, and the lovers of all kinds. At the third gate of forgiveness, we release our willingness to use our power over others or giving our power over to others through our rage, our blame, our labeling, and through being a victim. We move towards to sharing our power with others and in collaboration and to empowering others. At the fourth gate of forgiveness, we unblock our heart by feeling the grief of our loss. Allowing the tears to flow releases the heart to love once more. At the fifth gate of forgiveness, we let go of self-betrayal and living a life which is not aligned to our highest purpose and truth. We find our voice to speak out and our truth and live with full integrity. At the sixth gate of forgiveness, we move away from living a life based purely within the physical world to living one connected to a vision of something greater guided by our intuition and inner wisdom. And at the seventh gate of forgiveness, we become the channel for peace, aligning ourselves fully to our highest purpose. Three things you can do to get started is firstly to make a list of anyone you are holding resentment, anger or desire for revenge against and why. It might be parents, siblings, family members, God, your significant others, your children, yourself, your body, your friends, colleagues, employers, politicians, the, the list is endless. For each of the people you can name, complete the following statement. I am holding on to, whether it be anger, resentment or hatred towards whoever because they, and just write what they have done in your eyes that has, has hurt you. And just keep writing these statements. So you're beginning to get a sense of this is where I'm holding on. So you're getting a bit of an overview. So that, that's one thing you can do now. The second thing is once, you, once you've got that is to choose one and to focus to really focus in and say, actually, I'm going to heal this one. I'm going to start here. It doesn't matter where you start, just start with one of them and at this point write down your painful story just put it all down onto paper and when new things happen to trigger the memory or to trigger the hurt write it down so create a space somewhere where you are going to write your painful story and contain it we put it in a kind of container if we don't do that, we tend to talk about it a little bit to this person and to that person. And it, it's like seeds. We send out all these seeds out into our interactions in our life. And what I invite you to do is bring it back. Bring your story back. It was your story. It happened to you and it's real. So contain it, bring it back. And it's sacred. What happens to us is sacred. It's, it's uh, part of our heart, part of our journey. And this, from our story, we bear witness to ourselves. This happened. It happened to me. Um, but it doesn't define you. You are more than any painful story that happened to you. You are more than that. So we start to contain our story and then we can work from that place of our story as foundation. There is a lot to be learned from our story. So that's what I invite you to do as a second step. And as a third step, 
is to set your intention. Intention is very powerful. It's to say, actually, I choose to heal. I choose to heal this. I want to let this go. I want to find love again. I want to be free of this. And one way you can do this, I find nature very powerful, is you go to find a place in nature and sit and breathe. Just notice how your body is and just allow yourself just to relax in that moment. And allow yourself to think about, if I were to let go of this pain and suffering, how would it feel? What change would you like to see in yourself? What would you be doing if you were no longer holding on to all of this suffering? What would happen to your energy? Notice the people you would be with and how you are interacting with those people if you were to let this go. And when you imagine this future self that has gone through this journey, what advice would you give you to the person who's still hurting? What advice would you give to that part? And when you are ready, just make the commitment. I commit to this healing process. And in that space, wherever you are, just try and find a little, uh, whether it be a stone or a pebble or a leaf or something natural that somehow for you symbolizes that healing process and bring it back with you and place it somewhere. And every time you look at it, every time, yeah, just keep tuning into that place of healing and future, future well-being. It's very, very powerful to set your intention, particularly in nature, and to be witnessed that this is what I choose and you will be aided and helped. You're not on this journey on your own. So those are my three, uh, three top tips <laughs> to, get, to get you started. And as, as peace builders, we are needed now more than ever to do our work at the highest and deepest possible level. And in order to do this, we have to do the inner work. There is no getting around it. If we build peace in the outer world, but we do it with rage and pain in our heart, we will only build so far and so high. The true inspiration for our work must come from the foundation of healing that we are able to bring forth from our own heart to our own people and to our own land. In this way, the river of painful stories, which has been passed to each and every one of us from our ancestors, from the pain that hasn't been healed up to now, stops with us. And from this point onwards, it's peace that flows forward from you and through you. If forgiveness were a person, she would be a woman. She, like many others who have stood and spoken up for peace in the world, has been deemed a threat to the old world order. She's been put in chains, hidden away, possessed, owned, treated like a slave, and her story and gifts withheld. She is the one with the key to, to peace. So I really invite you to get to know and invite forgiveness into your own lives, to honor her gifts and be humbled by her demands for your growth and healing. And I'm here to serve you on your journey. Please reach out to me if I can assist you. I guide people through the seven gates to forgiveness. And yeah, please just reach out for me. Don't feel that you have to go through this, through this on, on your own. Um, as a final note, I just wanted you to know that I have been brought to my knees in my own life by betrayal and abandonment. And by undertaking this forgiveness process, I have returned clearer, stronger, and with more love and compassion in my heart than ever before. It is possible and there is hope. There is no way to kill peace, love or forgiveness, for they are much bigger than death, hate or suffering. And be the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Helen Tanya. I think I should not add anything to it. And maybe we can just go to Lablu because I think it will 
just help us to continue what you have told us and to practice it a little bit more now to go into our inner world in our own inner world by mindfulness so I don't dare to put the screen on anymore. So sorry, Lablu, I would just talk about you that way. Um, so Lablu, he is um, a Therabas, you, you are a Buddhist, Buddhist monk from Theravadi studies, that's right? Yes. Yes, okay. So Lablu Barua, he is uh, a spiritual teacher and a mindful mindfulness mediation expert. And as this, he has come to join us today. And but he also pursues um, BBA and MBA degrees and now a PhD degree at the university in Thailand, the Buddhist University. I don't dare to say the name; it's too long. Okay, <laughs> the university. And you're also an ambassador of Institute for Economics and Peace. And you have been uh, working with different organizations to promote inner and outer peace. And in this capacity as a Buddhist leader, you have visited uh, different countries and you have promoted interreligious and intercultural dialogue. So you are also an author of numerous articles and uh, you are especially now promoting interface dialogue such as hindu buddhist or buddhist muslim dialogue and you are switching between thailand and bangladesh right now you are in bangladesh yes and um, yes. yes and i would just like to invite you now just to continue after helen's speech to talk a little bit more about this method of mindfulness, which can be one of the methods how we can work within ourselves and how we can focus. Thank you very much, Lavlu. So good afternoon from Bangladesh and my blissful regard to Karin, Helen, Professor Jans and all facilitators and greetings to all participants in here. I'm going to talk about how mindfulness can contribute to peace and the futures. I think that everyone, we are listening every day, mindfulness in our daily life. So mindfulness, because it's used as a desk in a religious institute, a school, college, university, and in many government and private organizations. So what is mindfulness to you? That is my question. When I talk mindfulness, I might use some ancient Buddhist philosophical words as I am a Theravada Buddhist monk and my more riches on the Theravada Buddhist perspective of mindfulness. And so, and also mindfulness I start during the Buddha's times is 2,560 years ago and until today. So for me, mindfulness is like a completely engaged in a present moment, each moment with the eloquent mind. And in our lives and paying attention one things as it is arising. Like our Buddha said, yatha bhuta, that means whatever is arising, see it exactly, accurately, and rightly. So if you see something very rightly and clearly, moment to moment, then there is a no doubt, which is in our Buddhist uh, philosophical word called uh, Bichikisa, that means doubtful, no doubtful. If you have doubt, some things about unreal, real, you cannot realize the reality and you feel fear, worry, and many also mental problems. According to Buddhist philosophy, if we have a doubtness and we can develop ourselves which is called the unwholesome or unskillful road is a greedy, hatred, and delusions. And those of the things mostly affect 
in our life uh, to the inner quality and is make effort to make our balanced life or to give in some forgiveness to others. So most important, we have to control our three things, which is called the uh, Okusala Mula or unwholesome activity or unskilled activity, hatred, delusions, and greedy. Because this is like us uh, in our uh, killer, silent killer of poisons for the mind. So mindfulness we have to do in all the times, like I said, when you're taking the, our technique we use mostly uh, anapanasriti, that means breath in and breath out. And I tell you that we have to think that how breath in comes, how breath in out, because this is related to the, our oxygen, we are taking oxygen and we are going to out our carbon dioxide, which is not uh, good for the also for the environment too much carbon. But oxygen, without oxygen, we cannot live as our life. So we must have to be all the times when you take a practice meditations and you have to practice with the, our process we call the satipatthana, that means uh, breath in and breath out. So while we practice this kinds of uh, meditations or mindfulness meditation, and why it is important? Because this is very important and this is very simple way to develop our inner quality, our personal inner quality. That's why in our Buddha said, knowing yourself, Tumme Janata, it is Pali called Pali called. That means we must have to know first ourselves. And we have to develop positive mind and positive change and positive energy. If we have a positive mind and positive energy, then we can change to the family, from the individual to family, and family to the our community and community to going to the street. So this is very important and mindfulness is generating us also developing the peace, a positive peace, because a mindfulness which we are doing, this is like as a systematic, because it is like an art. You have to sit in one place every day, uh, maybe one hour, maybe half an hour, maybe 10 minutes, it depends on you. But you must have to practice every day because mind always, something comes all the times. The emotions, many kinds of emotions come in your minds, but you have to make balance all of the things with your mind. So that to I, I said that this is like as an art of life. You have to adjust with your life from the Morning's time, maybe half an hour, evening times, maybe half an hour. And then it is like a systematic, you have to sit. After the sessions, maybe I'll be tell you how can practice these kinds of mindfulness uh, according to the uh, Anapana Sriti or mindfulness of breathing. And this one changes our inside, our behaviors. And also this behavior, we can change from the, if we are big individually, behavior can change, good behavior, we can upset, then we can follow is the many institute. And the institute is going like a structurally. So therefore, I describe mindfulness is like an art and it's like a way of life to live in a present moment to moment. And it can reduce from our hatred, delusions, and because we can observe our minds moment to moment by breath in and breath out. So this is the what the technique we are, and is make you also awareness yourself because when you practice breath in and breath out, all the times you feel that you have a breath. So that's why you live in this world. If you don't have a breath, how can you live? That means you are a die. 
If you die, there is nothing. So why you feel ready? Why you feel hatred to other? Why you feel uh, the lotions to do uh, find something more and to you can then make forgiveness and you can develop your quality more compassion loving kindness in your side so this is the uh, we are following and also is uh, tell you this our realize the situations because when we sit understanding ourselves and we any particular things or any whatever arise, we can think and we can positively think and we can positively understanding and correctly understanding and then we can understand what the behind the reasons for this. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah, yeah, because I cannot find any voice, that's why I'm asking. So, and another thing, uh, like I said, for the why I'm telling this, why is need for the futures? Because all the, we have to must think for the presence. If we live in a presence with the happy life and with the positive life and with the hours uh, controlling our non hate, and we can non delusions and non. Uh, violence quality can develop, it will develop our sight and it can also can give them good uh, actions to others. Like as nowadays, we most of people are suffering from the COVID-19. I think this is like a night dreams. Like today, I just got one of my cousins die. It's reality, we have to accept because you don't have everything, that's why he died. And you know, at this moment, I just got the news yesterday from the World Health Organization's director said that most of the people at this moment die from the lack of oxygen. And if we don't have a lack of oxygen and they fail, some organ fail. So this is the things what is happening. So this is have to understanding ourselves. And what is going when this crisis come and many of multiple problem is coming because of some people losing their job, some people have social problems because they are living in one places which is called isolated or quarantine, or they are the social distance, physical distance. Even today, some of the my relatives die, but we cannot go there because of there are some of the rules and regulations, and it makes us stress and feel unhappy. But when we feel that this is the reality, I have to accept because of I have to live for myself. This is my breathings. If I lose my breathings, so how can I help others? So you have to think about yourself. So that's why. One of the Buddhist philosophy tell what we are telling this by practicing right mindfulness because mindfulness, not many kinds of mindfulness. Now at this moment, the teachings, but we are telling this right mindfulness. Right mindfulness means to you have to feel for your bodily and verbal and mental actions and it properly manage your actions to make best use and value of life. And it will reduce the social conflict and it will reduce the mental conflict and it will reduce the others' problems, individuals and also societal problems. Because when you do uh, the Anapana Sriti, then you can realize everything and you can make your life as a middle we call, which is we call the Majjima Putipada, that means the middle way of life or moderate of life. Whatever you need at this moment, you have to upset it and you have to be happy with it as like you are happy with your breathings. If you don't have a breathings, you cannot live. That means whatever you need as the most essentials, if you have that things, then you can, can to the happy, to other things, and you will be happy with the 
a small things and it's developing your inner quality such as a patience tolerance sympathy because when you feel in as a meditation of the mindfulness as a breathing then you also got some of the uh, physical uh, symptoms like a pain in your uh, shoulders and got uh, also pain in your back bones and also got pain and some symptom will be occurs but you cannot do this you cannot think that of things because if you think you cannot concentrate your minds which is the things coming and going so that's why excuse me yeah. can i just ask you now to come to your end because we will be running out of time and we would still have would like to have the discussion groups is that possible Yes, so that means uh, we must have to be practice mindfulness, my calculations, and if we have a two or three minute, and I'll be show you how to we have to do this kinds of mindfulness meditations. If you have a two or three minute, can you have a two to three minutes? Well, we we have already we've already lost about ten minutes, so maybe we can just leave it like this, and maybe you can do it in your group. Would that be mm -hmm. helpful? Yeah. So yes. my advice at this moment, okay, so if we don't have a time, so my advice for the protect the futures, you have to think present moment and you have to be satisfied, accept what is going on everything. You will be willing as like you accepting your breathings. So at like you accept whatever going and you live with the present moment and then will be future will be good. So thank you very much everyone to listen with me and I still with me thank you so much lavlo okay thank you and maybe there will be another opportunity now even to show that exercise in the smaller break up group so i think it's still important that we all got now get now an opportunity to discuss among us and as we are 27 participants for the moment this doesn't seem to be too difficult to split up into small groups and then to have some more discussion and i can just give you some very general guiding questions because we try to find out during the whole conference today what lessons learned we can take back home and how we can use them for the future and for our future peace work so I think you can also turn your discussion around these questions and I will try to paste now into the chat. I hope it will work uh, some guiding questions. I think most groups will have a facilitator uh, where you, who is already assigned. If you don't have a facilitator, maybe just you find a volunteer among yourselves by self-organizing yourself, somebody who's got some experience just to do that kind of online facilitation. And uh, yes, I hope you will get it on your chat. And but just uh, maybe I can give you now 15 minutes and maybe we just get a, go a little bit longer because we have a break after that of 15 minutes. So whoever wants to leave before, it's okay. But please, I would be glad if you all keep to it now. So I hope uh, Natalia or somebody else is there to split us into groups. Can I hear from somebody? Okay, with micro. I yes. have already uh, I have already made up the breakout room, so oh, we have so perfect. put the timing on fifteen minutes. Yes, I think so. Okay, so but don't use your time organizing yourself, but start discussing very quickly, and you might also have the chance to discuss more with the panelists. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Eva. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Many ones knowing him here. <laughs> so. Okay, so we are still 20 participants or even more. Everybody's back. Okay, 21. Thank you. Thank you that you're still all here, that you did not rush right away <laughs> to the break. Um, I hope that you have written all into your chat and that we can still manage to find this chat. Did somebody, if, if I, do you know whether you could copy it from the group chats? I'm sorry, I forgot. You forgot. Oh dear. There's one more question in the group chat actually. 
Huh? And there was no question in the group chat. Yeah, apparently I, I did not know how to paste it into all the different groups. Sorry. Uh, our group chat was empty as well. It was three of us. Uh, and um, so it was just uh, chatting. <laughs> Okay, maybe we just try now within five minutes to collect from how many groups were we, Eva? Four. Four groups. Okay, it's not too much. Yeah. Um, maybe we just collect from each group uh, two, three po key points you found, which then we can collect now and we could also take to the closing plenary this um, afternoon, because that's where we collected them from all the sessions and workshops. I can post my comments here if yes. you want. Yes. Uh, what I collected from the presenters. Yes. Uh, no, okay. Not from the presenters. The presenters, I think. Um, but my yeah, you can still you you mean you can post it? You can just copy it into the chat. Oops. One. Shanas, was it you? You said you can you can p paste it into the chat. Yeah, I can. Okay, now you can put it here. I okay. Just put it in here. Yes. So very good. <clears throat> okay, maybe another group. Can you just? Uh, yes. Hi, Karin. I try to um, write it down. This is or, Nino. Uh, you, uh, I was. Yes. yes. Nino. Yes, our group also came up with some insights, and uh, I would like to invite Matthew, who was uh, a reporter and recorder for our uh, breakout group, uh, who will share all those inspiring ideas that we came up uh, out of the inspiring presentations, of course. <laughs> The three key things that we that we talked about was the importance of forgiveness that uh, if without forgiveness uh, love is 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 hard. Um, the second is the importance of love and how uh, loving oneself uh, and being able to love oneself um, may lead to being able to love others without respect to uh to race and uh ethnicity and all the th things that seem to divide us and the third was the importance of empathy um the the statement if you cannot feel a person's skin and shoes it is hard to forgive them and so we really uh found this uh, a very inspiring um uh, idea of connections of inner and our inner and outer worlds, inner and outer peace, and uh, looking at at ourselves at this moment as um, a way of stopping that river of uh, pain and resentment from generations, perhaps, uh, and letting only peace flow forward. Thank you very much. Thank I, you. I managed Thank you. more or less to write it down. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, another group. Maybe Yuki will be so kind to tell what we were speaking about. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, I don't take all notes, but uh, what I yeah, took is um, yeah, so uh, overcoming uh, trauma, healing, that kind of thing could be really cultural. So uh, one um, way of um, yeah, intervention could work in certain country or area, but uh, not really to others. So it could be really cultural and it could be religious as well. And also uh, we discussed that um, forgiveness could be a little bit um, Western way of thinking or a philosophy or idea and uh, but um uh, from buddhist point of view it could be maybe closer idea to respect others and uh, have a compassion to others i think that's all from my memo but could you add if you have some more i'll try to type uh, very shortly mm -hmm. because i was making notes 
Okay, you can, you can you. could you just you can you can, could you just say but from the Buddhist point of view it's more about respect and respect to others and uh, compassion. Compassion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So who who else? We just collect. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask um Devan Datta, who was only, we were only two people who were discussing in our group to say a sentence about what we were discussing. So you were, what did, I did not get it. Just, could you just speak a little bit louder? Devan, yeah, are you, can you join the group now? Yeah. Why, but I understand that it's his previous group. No, we are still well being and peace in here. Okay. No, because if I could you just repeat what you said? I did not hear it very well. I see that I... one will talk for group number four now. Okay. okay. But it's finished. We are going to start our session in six minutes. The next session in six minutes. Okay. So do we have just one more last important point? I think we had in our group, we had the point, I have already written it down, um, that in order to come up to forgiveness, there is a whole process needed how people can do that kind of healing and how they learn again to talk to each other and uh, only then they will become able at a certain moment to talk and to forgive and to go on in that process. Okay, so thank you very much so much also for all our speakers and please take back home some of these ideas between the inner and the outer world between inner and outer peace and spread it around you because I think we need it everywhere in the world. We have millions of people of traumatized uh, people and we need to find way, ways out of it towards more sustainable peace. Thank you so much for all of you having been here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For it was a pleasure to have you with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so um, much for inspiring. Yes.